For all y'all ain't never been to a water park, picture everybody at Walmart with bathing suits on, all right? In a career spanning three decades, Larry the Cable Guy has solidified himself as a comic force to be reckoned with, tackling top-tier roles in radio and television. I never sweated so much in my life. Rising to pop culture fame on the Blue Collar Comedy Tour and driving an independent path to success on the silver screen. My name is Mady. Like Tom Major without the tub. But his representation of a segment of the population that goes largely ignored by mass media made for a challenging climb to the top. How his talent and likability cut across the long established boundaries of Hollywood, and why, after making it big, this Midwestern family man continues to stay faithful to his small town roots. This is the Rural Americans. Guess I gotta do this before I go any further, I suppose. Get her done. Get her done. <laughs> Larry the Cable Guy, known for ushering in big laughs with his southern draw, sleeveless shirts, and unmistakable catchphrase, was born on February 17, 1963. And his earliest memories come from growing up on a farm in the nation's heartland. Your God-given name is Dan Whitney. Yes, it is. What city were you born in? The big metropolis of Pawnee City, Nebraska. The little redneck corner in Nebraska down there. There's only one Pawnee City, and uh, that's where I'm from. When I lived there, we used to take turns being mayor. <laughs> it is small. Matter of fact, the courthouse came up to here on me. I mean, it is a small. <laughs> I live next to the cattle barn, the sale barn, so it had a you know livestock exchange and. It was tiny. I think when I lived there, it was 1,270. And it was awesome, you know? I was just on the outskirts. I lived on a farm just off the city limits. So I pretty much knew everybody in town. But it was great. It was just a good small town growing up. My dad was a horse guy, so we had uh, 14 registered paint horses. And we had some cattle. And I did the hogs. I did hogs. I wanted to, I loved raising pigs. So my job, you know, around the farm, man, we dug a lot of post holes and filled in. And of course, my dad never wanted to do anything easy, so we had the post hole digger where you have to go like this <laughs> and do it. The reason I'm not a beer drinker is those days because uh, my dad got thirsty one time. My mom ran up the store and bought a six pack because my dad's thirsty. And uh, I was off doing something and I came back and there was only one thing left. The water was gone. Whatever else they got was gone. There was one beer left, and it was a hot schlitz. When I was about 11, I drank a hot schlitz because I was so thirsty. And it's, oh, it's the worst thing I ever had in my life. And, that, and every time I pop a beer open, I, all I remember is that warm schlitz, and I can't do it. His outgoing mom, Shirley, worked as a nurse's aide and homemaker, while his father, Tom, a good-natured yet strict disciplinarian, served in the Air Force. And while in combat in Korea, he dedicated his life to Jesus. After he returned home, he became a minister and an educator. He was a good preacher. He was, uh, you know, he wasn't that good of a dad. You know, my dad was old school, so he, you know, he was mainly work, do this, do that, yes sir, no sir, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I honestly, I can't remember, like I envy people that like go out and golf with their dad and they're real close with their dad. I was never real close, you know? So it is what it is. I don't, you know, I don't hate him or anything. I love him, you know, I'm a forgiving guy. I got forgiveness, so. Nobody's perfect in this world, and he uh, wasn't perfect. That's where mom came in pretty handy. As a kid, growing up next to the Livestock Exchange Building afforded new opportunities, and in his pursuit of childhood dreams, he garnered experience that would lend itself to his future in comedy. I loved the sale barn. I loved livestock. And so I spent literally, if I wasn't doing an activity from school, I spent every minute of the day over at the cattle barn doing whatever they needed done because I loved it. 
Kenny Klepper, uh, he ran that place. He took me under his wing when I was just little, when I was maybe six or seven, is when I started getting into hog farming. And I remember he took me to a sale, but he bought me three or four little baby feeder pigs that they just, they're just babies. Some have the mom or some, but they, they pulled them off of this. And I kept them in the closet in the house upstairs. My mom, dad's room was there. My, me and my brother's room was here, two beds. And then there was a closet in the middle hallway with me and my brother's clothes in it. And I stuck them piglets in there and I'd go up and bottle feed them and I'd try to hide them from my mom. But at some point, you know, they started stinking and you could hear them and the smell. And so I had to find a different place for them. But that's what I did. That's when I went down and I took the barn. I was just little. I took the barn and uh, I had to get some help. You know, I was just little. But then we made one, two, three, four, five big pens and made sure and put fencing outside. Probably the time I was nine or 10, 11 years old, you know, I was going over to the sale barn and buying 50, 60 head of hogs at a time. Kenny taught me how to understand the announcers, the auctioneer. Now, why do they do it? I don't know, just theatrical. You don't really have, but that's how they do it. But I would learn to understand them. And so I remember early on, Kenny knew I was looking to buy some hogs. And so some had come in, they sold hogs first and cattle second. And uh, he'd look at me and he'd kind of go, kind of wink at me, right? And then, hey, what do you get for 25? 25, that would have been enough high, that would have been enough why would do do bad, you know, kind of like that. Every time I bought some, they, Ab Christians in the auction would go, 25, five, sold to little Danny Whitney from across the street. One of my best friends in the whole world is Marty, my buddy Marty Hill from South Coffeyville, Oklahoma. Grew up exactly like I did, right next to the sale barn in South Coffeyville. Grew up wanting to be an auctioneer. Same with me, except I'm a comedian. He's an, Now he is an auctioneer, world class. And, uh, but it's funny with auctioneers, I always tease him because if you're talking numbers, they go automatically into auctioneer. Like you'd be talking to Marty, you go, Marty, where'd you get them boots? Boy, those are good boots now. <laughs> so I'm like, 952. These are authentic, whatever, you know. Marty, how much you pay for them boots? $345, three, four, five. I mean, every time. Marty, what'd you pay for them tennis shoes? Oh, they just a little cheapies. I got them for $42. Four, two, 42. That's what I love about auctioneers. That if you're talking numbers, they're in auctioneer mode. But I always wanted to do that. I always think it's fun. I go up some celebrity golf events, you know. I'll go up and... The auctioneer will be doing it, and then I'll be like, ah, move aside, this is, you know, and they'll just be like, you know, $25, can I get 30 You know, if there's somebody doing it like that, I'll get up and go, here's how you do it, let me sell this. Like, I'll sell, like, I like to sell, like, a birthday call to, as maid or to a kid or something for charity, you know, and so, I remember one time I go, let me, I'm an auctionist, I'm going to show you how a real auctioneer does this. What do you give a thousand dollars right now, boys? What a thousand dollars now? Fine, that wouldn't be enough. Fine, that wouldn't be enough. Hand out to that hand out. That wouldn't be enough. You know, just but then he giggled and then just kind of like to that two thousand. You know, that gets the crowd rolling. <laughs> you know, I'm not that good at it, but I can fake it. You know, every now and then. You're pretty good at it. I can fake it. <laughs> Well, Christine, I'm good at a lot of things. But I just loved it. It was fun. I love that life to this day. I love that life. When we were out on tour, 280 days out on the road, living on buses. Uh, if I ever saw a sale barn and we had time, I'd say, pull over. I want to go to the cattle sale. One time we were working, I think it was the, I think it was a Budweiser event center outside of Boulder, Colorado. We were parked by the center, but to my left, there's a whole complex. But it was a big outdoor rodeo arena and a couple of buildings, but they had all these pens. And I noticed there was some cattle in them, roping steers. And I said, man, and the mountain, you know, that sky, and it's just so pretty. Nobody was up. I got up and I popped a dip in and I went over and I sat on the chute gate, just sat there by the loading dock, looking at the cattle and just kind of, it was awesome. All of a sudden I hear, 
I look, here comes a pot belly. Pot belly is a big old pot belly cattle truck. That's a pot belly. <laughs> I had a guy that worked for us out on the road uh, built me this pot belly trailer cattle hauler. So one of those pulled up, full of cattle. I look around, there's nobody there. He backs up. I go, hey, where do you want these? He said, ah, just put them with the others. I'm on it. I ran down there, opened the gate, ran back up. I see him out there, he's putting his gloves on. I open the back. I, they come out, I push some of them out. He does one of these. He goes, I appreciate it. I go, yeah, he goes, but he goes just like this. I appreciate it. Larry, the cable guy? I go, yeah, and he goes, what the hell are you doing unloading my cattle truck? I go, you know, I got a show tonight. We got here early. I saw these steers over here. I just, I, I just came over to have a dip and look at them. He goes, well, I'll be done. He used other choice language. He goes, well, that's something else. And we got them all unloaded. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what. Can I get a picture with you? Oh, it was great. I loved it. That's, I, to this day, I love it. You know, I bought in, I bought some stock, invested a little bit, not a lot, in the Beatrice 77 sale barn. That's a good sale barn here in southeast Nebraska. If you ever have any cattle needs, head down there to Beatrice 77. I did it for the sole purpose of, if I want to, I can get on the chute gate and I can unload a cattle truck and nobody in there can tell me to get the hell out of there because I am an investor. <laughs> <laughs> Next on The Rural Americans, Larry the Cable Guy begins his climb to superstardom. From his first live performance as a stand-up comedian to blue-collar fame. Long before his first taste of the spotlight as Larry the Cable Guy, Dan Whitney was a Nebraska farm kid with a passion for raising livestock. But just after his 15th birthday, he learned that he'd have to trade in life on the farm for the bright lights of the city when his father was offered a job at an elementary school in West Palm Beach, Florida. Fifth largest Christian school in the United States, the King's Academy. Was it a hard decision for him to move your family across the country? No. No. It's all about him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wouldn't even let us take our dog with us. <laughs> no, it wasn't hard. I had no, you know, I don't know what's going on. I was 15. I missed everybody. Yeah, but there were more than 10 girls in my class. <laughs> it was West Palm Beach, Florida, and I started to really enjoy it. <laughs> After graduation, he took a job as a bellhop at the Hyatt Regency, a position that would ultimately open the doors for his career as a stand-up comic. Great job, loved it. I tell anybody, if you want a good job and you want a, a job that can lead to other jobs, be a bellman. We had a blast, we were fun. That's where I found I wanted to be a comedian because I used to pick up airline crews and make them laugh. Like, you gotta be a comedian, you need to be a comedian. That's when I seriously thought about, well, maybe I should go up on stage one night. Everybody seems to think I'm funny. But the cool thing is, every week, hey, you know, if you ever wanna get into blah, 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 here's my card, give me a call. You know, because any business can use somebody that's good with people, that has a good personality and is friendly and, you know, just outgoing, a go-getter. With a little encouragement from his friends, he built up the confidence to try an open mic night at a local hotspot. And he made his stand-up debut at Houlihan's Restaurant and Bar. And I was dressed in a buckwheat t-shirt and a David Lee Roth hat with a non-lit cigar. And I brought a boom box with my own laughter on it and a copy of the Weekly World News. And it was very physical comedy at the time. You know, I like slapped the cigar and it blew up and I fell down and then I pressed the button after every joke and had my own applause break. I thought it was funny at the time. If you go back and rewatch it, you know, if I would have backed out, I tell everybody, don't ever, if you want to try to do something, just give it a shot. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But don't back out because you never know what's going to happen. And I almost backed out because there's guys down there in suits going over note cards, 
And I'm thinking, man, there's professionals at this thing. I thought this was like an open mic comedy. What are these guys doing? You know? So I went up and I did my thing and I got hooked. And I was hooked ever since. After finding initial success, Dan soon learned that making the transition from open mic nights to paid gigs would require thick-skinned perseverance and countless hours of writing and rehearsing. But he happened to be in the right place at the right time, where preparation met opportunity. And I was very fortunate because stand-up just started really exploding in the mid to early 80s. So that's when it really started kicking. All these clubs were opening and we were like the, comedy was like the new rock stars, you know? Weird thing happened to me last Sunday. I'm watching America's Most Wanted. All of a sudden my dad got up real fast, turned the channel, shaved his beard off. <laughs> <laughs> Come even phone sex too. He goes, hey, when did I tell your mother what you've been doing? I said, hold on, I'll let you talk to her. <laughs> I was very fortunate about a year later not even a year, that summer in 1986, the Comedy Corner opened up in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I, I was the first one through the door. Live from West Palm Beach, it's the Comedy Corner, bringing today's top comedy stars to the Palm Beaches. I and mean, I lived every minute of the day at that comedy club. And it happened to be owned by a guy named John Stoll who was so good to me, he was so awesome, but he was loaded. He was one of the biggest bookers of entertainment in Florida. Phantasma Productions. You know, I wasn't ready to do big things, but John, you know, he, he'd always throw me on in front of acts and stuff, so. Like one time Chicago was doing a tour through Jacksonville, Miami, Tampa, Orlando. John goes, eh, I'll give you 500 bucks a night. You know, go, go give me 15 minutes in front of Chicago. And it wasn't that good. I mean, I probably had a good funny 12 minutes, but that's what I did. So I'd just show up in my car and I'd go do jokes in front of Chicago. I don't know if they thought it was funny or not. I mean, it made the crowd laugh. It was just cool, you know? So I, I was very fortunate to have a good start like that. Let's talk about how Larry the Cable Guy evolved because you were doing a, a number of different characters, but one stood out amongst all of the others. There was all kinds of radio characters I did, but the Larry the Cable Guy thing just was, happened just, I enjoyed doing it, it was fun. I wanted to create a character that was Archie Bunkerish, but likable. This is Larry the Cable Guy. There's a lot of ways to say get her done. This is one, get her done. Here's another one. Get her done. And here's another different way. Get her done. All three different meanings to the word get her done. Probably one of the main contributors to the character was a guy that was working construction at the radio station. A little short, chubby guy. So he come out just like this. Hey, Larry. Hey, buddy, how are you? Hey, listen, I know you gotta do your little funny jokes and tell your fart jokes and all that, but you've done this commentary today on keeping the prayer in the public schools. You are GD right. These effing blah, 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 they don't got the Lord Jesus in there and these blah, blah, blah. This guy is cussing up a storm, talking about you need to keep Jesus in the schools. He means well, but he doesn't know how to get his point across without swearing every third word. You know what I mean? It's a contradiction all in one. He, he, he's right, but he's going about it the wrong way. You know what I mean? So when I started doing my commentaries, I wanted to make a little point where people will go, yeah, you know what, that makes sense. Probably could have said it a different way. <laughs> that's what I was going for, because that's funny. I find that funny. But that's one of the guys where I got the character from. I just kind of combined him with a couple of farmers from Nebraska and a couple of my classmates and came up with this character. I was saying stuff that you're like, whoa. I mean, nowadays, forget about it. But even in the 90s, you're saying stuff and it's like, but it was a different world.
With his comedy career jump-started by word-of-mouth popularity, he gained further exposure when he decided to bring the character from the airwaves to the stage, putting Larry the Cable Guy in an elite group of working comedians. Nowadays, comics are clicky, but they're mean. There's a lot of backbiting, and we were very fortunate to have such good crews. We pulled for each other, you know? So we had a click of comics in West Palm Beach, there was a clique of comics in Orlando, and I remember we made friends with those guys. And so we had a blast, but this is a great story. Uh, we'd always go out to eat at Denny's on Lee Road after the show, and then we'd have to drive back to West Palm Beach. So one night after an open mic night, we all were sitting in a booth, telling jokes and writing down bits. At the table, that night, at that table, Carrot Top, Billy Gardell, Jim Brewer, Daryl Hammond, me, Larry the Cable Guy, my buddy Tom Ryan. Oh, and a guy named Chris Baker. Oh, and Tom Rhodes. I mean, that is a table full of, we always talk about it when we get together about how crazy our life is, you know. Although he was now regarded as a rising star in comedy, the pivotal point in his career came when he was asked to join the Blue Collar Comedy Troupe. Alongside comedians Jeff Foxworthy, Ron White, and Bill Engvall. And he looked at the pizza box, he goes, I thought you said you wasn't hungry. That sitting next to me is losing his mind. Apparently he had a lot to live for. I'll tell you what, I'm about to decide if it wasn't for the sex, I could be gay. <laughs> Hell, then you're just hanging out with your buddy. By the early 2000s, the Blue Collar Comedy Troupe became the all-stars on the scene, and their unique brand of Southern humor created a cultural shift in mainstream comedy, drawing big laughs from the countryside to the big city. We travel all over the country, and uh, we all been doing this for a number of... <laughs> I never considered you a spinner. <laughs> this is the same guy yesterday afternoon we're at the Lincoln Memorial and he said, I had no idea he was that big. I remember at the time how big you guys were. Every American, I feel like, at some point in their life has probably said, get her done. Oh yeah. The fact that you were able to penetrate pop culture in such a way Looking back now and looking at how rural America was really celebrated in that moment because right. of what you were doing, how does that feel when you look back and how It's really cool. I mean, they call us the, the redneck rat pack. I mean, just to have that. And we'll never be able to replicate that again. That is something that is now captured in time that we just look back on and go, man, how cool is that? Hey, well, when's your birthday? Uh, February 17th. Now, what year is your birthday? Every year. <laughs> Next, on The Rural Americans, how Larry the Cable Guy went on to become a celebrated television and film star, and why faith and family are the driving forces behind his success. After finding tremendous success with the Blue Collar Comedy Troupe, Larry the Cable Guy plunged even deeper into the limelight as a solo performer, selling out comedy clubs and arenas around the country with his name at the top of the marquee. Honey, does this, do I look fat in this? I don't know, how much is it? I'll tell you if you look fat in it or not. He went on to host Only in America, a History Channel travel series. Now, do you always gotta do this kind of a move? Cause I'm not comfortable with that move. And took on starring roles in major motion pictures like Health Inspector, Delta Farce, and Witless Protection. Most notably, he claimed the role of the lovable tow truck Mater in the widely acclaimed Cars animated franchise. How were you approached to do that role? Well, this is weird. I got a fax in 2002. It wasn't even Mater, it was Zeb. It said, we were gonna offer you the role of Zeb and our upcoming, we're big fans of yours, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, well, this is kind of cool. You know, I'm like, uh, well, when do I got to audition, you know? And my manager goes, no, you got it. And I'm like, I got it? What do you mean, I got it? I got to audition? He goes, no, they're giving me the part. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I literally broke down and cried. Oh, it was crazy. I go out to do it, and they're showing me around, and they're really cool. And 
and I booked a weekend. The punchline in San Francisco gave me the weekend so that I could work while I'm out there. It was really nice to me too. I went out there and they're showing me around and John Lasseter, this is really funny, he said that he went through 200 celebrities and 300 voice actors. He says, he just could not find the voice for this tow truck. I had a day to go before I picked somebody. He says, so on a whim, I said, go get that blue collar CD. He says, so I popped that on, you were the first thing that came on. He goes, I was doubled over laughing in the first two minutes. I called my secretary. I said, get that guy's agent on the phone. I found Mater. And he says, I was so excited. I was so happy I found Mater. So I went out there and I said before I did, I go, well, John, is Mater like, is he like real slow or is he, do you want him to be like this real like, hey? He goes, no, oh, he's you. He, he, just do, be you. Be Larry, Larry the Cable Guy. That's Mater, man. It's me, Mater. I said, that's it? He goes, yeah. I said, all right, undo that. I'm good at doing me. <laughs> so uh, he says his line, and I went, my name is Mater. Like Tom Mater without the tuck. And I look, and he's laughing. <laughs> That's great. And he goes, oh, oh, just give me one more. I got it. I got it. And I did one more, and it was real quick. I zipped through him, and he was laughing, and he loved it. And uh, I was doing a show in San Francisco. And this is how out of touch I am with modern anything, you know? I did the show, and he came to the show, and... Steve Jobs came, and everybody's freaking out at the punchline, and all these Pixar people are freaking out. And I'm like, what's going on? They go, Steve Jobs is here. I go, who's that? The guy's head of Apple, right? Apple, right? Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't even know. He goes, the head of Apple. I go, yeah, so? And I go, no, you don't understand. He doesn't go out. We never see that guy. But he's here at the club. And he sat right there next to Lasseter. For a man who never expected to become an iconic pop culture phenomenon, his career hit a sweet spot in 2006. And at the height of making a living doing what he loved, he put a cherry on top by marrying the love of his life, Kara, in an unconventional wedding ceremony in a Nebraska field. You two have a beautiful, beautiful relationship. She's also very funny. She is funny. She was a DJ, right? She was a DJ, yeah. She, I met her in Vegas. She was a, a DJ. When I met my wife, she was very shy. She was sitting over in the corner. Uh, she was best friends with the guy that worked at the station that was promoting my show. She worked on a different station, their sister station. And she, she just came with him because they were going to go do some stuff after. She's a homebody. He persuaded her to go out that night because she never went out. And I walked in. There's this really pretty girl just sitting in the corner quiet but when she did say something it was funny and you know what i'll be honest i remember when we first had were pregnant with her first kid when she was pregnant with the first kid she didn't tell me for three months because she didn't know how i would react and uh, i didn't even know because i was kind of getting used to her throwing up after we made love so i mean i didn't that wasn't a clue there i remember when she, and she was worried about having a baby. I remember she said to me one time, she says, when I have this baby, I want to be knocked out and unconscious. I'm like, that is so weird. That's how you were when you got pregnant. I mean, it was just the craziest thing. It came full circle. <laughs> She's a great woman of faith. And it seems like Absolutely. that's at the forefront of your household. Well, that's very important. Jesus saved her life, gave her hope, and she has changed her life around. Yeah, it's amazing what he can do. And so now, I mean, she writes books, and it's unbelievable. Who would have thought? I would have thought. She wouldn't, She doesn't even believe it. While remaining fundamentally grounded by his family and his faith, he now uses his massive platform to promote what's most important to him. Nobody in here that's perfect. And uh, we're a constant, we're a constant, uh, we're a constant work. But I'm glad I came back into the fold and, and I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. And it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with fame. Because fame and money and all the glitz never makes you happy. 
You know, people search and search and search for hope and happiness, and they reject the one thing that can give them hope and happiness. Uh, because, I'll tell you why, because they mix religion with being a Jesus follower. They don't get it. They don't get that being a Jesus follower isn't about rules and regulations. It's not about any of that. They don't get it. And so they get turned off by it because of religious people. And people seem to forget that it was the religious people that killed Christ. You know, the ones that were following Christ were sinners. They were fishermen and they were, I'm sure that they were, I'm sure that at some point in their life they were saying some disgusting jokes to each other. You know what I mean? But here's the difference. Jesus says, go and sin no more. I just don't think people understand the, the sanctification process when you are a follower of Christ. He says you're going to fall down seven times, but you're going to get back up. The difference is you're really trying to avoid that temptation and stop. You're not going to change overnight. It's a process. That's why you have to stay engaged in the Bible. You have to stay engaged with the teachings of Christ. The more you stay engaged, the more that you go through your life, you start realizing things that you're not doing anymore because you're engaged. That's what it's about. It's not about making sure that you say this every sixth day or you do. That's not what it's about. And people get all hung up on that. They think if you're a follower of Jesus, that you're going to have to walk around all day singing hymns and dressing in white robes. And that's not what it is. You're who, God made you you. You're still you. You have the same personality. You have the same likes, the same dislikes. It's you. The difference is your life will change for the better because you're not going to start doing things that eventually will harm your life because you'd make dumb decisions. You know, if you, if you have a Christian foundation and a Christian base and you follow Jesus, then you start to understand these things. And then you go, well, I'm not doing that because that leads to this and that leads to that. You know, that's the cool thing about the Bible. It never changes. There's two paths in life. You either believe Genesis 1 through 11 or you don't. If you believe Genesis 1 through 11, you have a goalpost you know where your goalpost is. If you don't believe Genesis 1 through 11, then you follow the world's goalpost. And the world's goalpost goes here, then it'll go here one time, then it'll go back to here, then it'll come here, then there's no goalpost, then there's a goalpost. And that's the cool thing about being a Christ follower. Nobody's perfect. You're not ever not going to sin again you're going to start being sanctified and understanding more about what you're doing wrong and that you shouldn't do it. Now, there's people that say they're Jesus followers and they just do anything they want. No, you're not. You're not a Christ follower because you're not actually trying to live a better life, not trying to live out the teachings of Christ. You're not doing it. You're going, well, I'll do it anyway. God will forgive me. That's not what it's about. And, you know, then you have these progressive Christians that are like, Jesus loves everybody and he just wants you to be happy. You know, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and gamblers and tax collectors. Yeah, he did. That's why they're in the Bible, to show us an example of anybody can be saved. But you're forgetting something in progressive Christianity. You're forgetting the words go and sin no more. <laughs> you're forgetting those words, you know? And it's like nowadays, if you're a follower of Jesus, you follow Jesus and you follow his teachings. You don't just follow what he, what you like, what you don't like. You either believe it or you don't. It's either his theology or it's your meology, you know? Are you going to have a meology or a weology? This is good for me. I'll take this. A lot of people do that. They take parts of the Bible they like and the parts they don't like. Well, that ain't how it works, I hate to tell you. That's my sermon for today. If you turn in your Bibles. <laughs> his home office is a reflection of his achievements, carefully adorned with the memorabilia that mark key moments from his journey. 
and some of his most prized possessions are his belt buckles. All right, this, I gotta show you this. This is really cool, look. Most comedians, their bit, the club, the things they wanna do, they always like, uh, they wanna play the amphitheater, they wanna do Red Rocks, which is cool, I wanna do those too. Like I got to do Radio City Music Hall. See, all those were cool. But I didn't, that wasn't anything that I was just glad I did it. It's really awesome. But for me, the three things, three goal places to work. When I was coming up, I wanted to do Cheyenne Frontier Days, because I'm a rodeo fan. I wanted to do Rodeo Houston, and I wanted to do the Calgary Stampede. All right, that was my goal in comedy. Once I started getting, I, I got to do these places. So, Cheyenne Frontier Days is, there's my buckle. I was the first comedian ever to perform at Cheyenne Frontier Day in uh, Wyoming. And uh, Rodeo Houston, I got to, that was the next one. I got my buckle for Rodeo Houston. I was stoked, so excited. And then I was in Calgary working the arena, the Saddle Dome, but I was never there for the stampede. The military is awesome, and I always did a bunch of stuff with the military. We uh, take a bunch of National Guard guys. I got a sweet box at the University of Nebraska, so we'll always open it up for six Guard guys every week to come in and watch the game with us. So this is stuff from the National Guard. But these guys went to Iraq, and they sent us an Iraqi Coke and, uh, wow. and this stuff and a flag that they flew for us. There's some of the Huskers and Operation Enduring Freedom in 2010. They sent me that. And then... I am a full-fledged sniper with an ID number and everything. It, only in America, I uh, went to sniper school and only in America. And I actually uh, did the ghillie wash. These, these are some cool things. I put this here. This is the first money I ever made doing stand-up. It was a contest in 1988, January 19th. I won $987 wow. in the 98.7 KGR comedy contest. And I put this and framed it here because that's the first time I ever got paid. It's a nice frame you chose. <laughs> well, you know me, I'm all class. Nobody ever gets to come see this. It's just kind of for me because there's never anybody in here. But. It's just good memories of just how awesome my fans are. And Billboard Award? Yeah, this was a big year for me. This was uh, my album, The Right to Bear Arms. And uh, it was the only comedy album ever to debut in the top 10 of the SoundScan Top 200. Uh, only comedy album to ever debut number one on the country music charts. But these are awesome. These are uh, 2005 uh, Comedy Artist of the Year Award and then Comedy Album of the Year for uh, the Right to Bear Arms. That album did so awesome for me. So five, six, and seven were just huge years. I, I'm proud of these. These were Grammy nominations. Didn't win, took second in that one. I took second, and then that's for the blue collar. All the guys got that. To be at the top of your game in such a hard industry, comedy is so hard. You know what, it was, it was just so much fun. My fans are just awesome. This is basically just memories of the fans and going out on the road and touring. Look, look, once I'm dead and gone, it's not, that doesn't mean that. Let me tell you, raising a good couple of kids, and that means way more. These are just, this is just good memories of a fun time I had out on the road and a good career I had. But it's just kind of cool that people like your stuff, that they'll uh, give you stuff like this. I got to show you this. This is me at Pebble Beach at the AT&T Pro-Am at Pebble Beach. I play in that. I'm very thankful. They invite me out there. They're nice folks. And, and I got that because I'm a huge golf fan. I love golf. Like I said, you get fat, and that's about the only thing you can do is golf anymore. I can't get down on the ground ball. See, I just hurt my back. This is cool. This is every character in Cars Tunes. I'm one of the few that have this. John Lasseter gave me this. And then it won a uh, outstanding animated character in an animated motion picture. There you go, Mater. This means a lot to me. I love Charlie Daniels. He was a good friend and always sweet to me. And he invited me to perform at his 80th birthday celebration. And oh, wow. They gave us this picture, and this is when I looked at it and said, I gotta lose some weight because my head is the size of a pea and I got a big fat body. It's the worst picture I ever did, but Charlie's in it, so I'll take it. But um, um, look at this. Look how little my head is in there. I mean, look at that. I got a little head and a big body. It's the worst picture I ever took. Oh, let me show you. This is a big deal here. Leno, 
I was the first guest for four nights in a row. And Jay and I had to come up with stuff to do. And so it was awesome. All four shows were great. I set a record. I was the only stand-up comic to ever do The Tonight Show four nights in a row and do bits and stand-up. But anyway, when I say we were calling looking for something to do, I was trying to find some fun bits to do. And so Ronnie Millsap uh, FedExed me Playboy, a Braille Playboy magazine. And Jay and I literally got 10 minutes of material off of this magazine. And it's literally, <laughs> and Ronnie Millsap signed it right there. But it was stupid. It was jokes like uh, Jay was going like this. He goes, hey, wow, that's nice, you know. And I go, let me feel it for a while, Jay. What the heck? And then I would go, oh, you idiot, Jay. That's the Marlboro Man. You know, so it was, it was funny. So we did about 10 minutes. But that's just one of the items that that's we did. Cool. That's why it's so special. That was just a fun night. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, that's a, a pretty good body of work right there. Looking back at his career, he acknowledges that he could not have done it alone. And among the many people who helped him along the way, Jeff Foxworthy is at the top of the list. I'm very thankful that Jeff came into my life and showed me the ropes on it and taught me a lot of stuff. Jeff said, Jeff told me this is very important in my career. Jeff said to me a long time ago, he said, look, just work hard. He said, just work hard. He goes, it's called show business for a reason. Everybody likes the show part. Not a lot of people like to do the business part, but if you're good at the business part, the show part's gonna come. And if you're good at the show part and the business part together, it's gonna be pretty good. And then he said, but just remember this, if you think you're gonna win an Emmy or you think you're gonna win a Grammy or you think you're gonna win some major award for doing what you do, it ain't gonna happen because mainstream media and Hollywood is not big fans of blue collar comedians. So he told me that early on, don't expect to get any accolades or don't expect to get any critical acclaim from anything you do no matter how good it is. And he goes, but work hard and you're gonna, the, and the fans are gonna love you. And he was right. And just work hard, be nice. In 2009, to thank the fans that catapulted him to stardom, he performed in front of a sellout crowd of 53,000 at Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, Nebraska, offering tickets for just $4. Next, on The Rural Americans, we hit the links for a golf lesson, as only Larry the Cable Guy can provide. Larry the Cable Guy has been bringing on the laughter for over 30 years, and you may also find the easily identifiable face behind the household name familiar from Prilosec ads. You do all these things, and that's what you're known for. I had a New York Times bestseller book, I had movies, TV shows, and they recognized me from the heartburn commercial. <laughs> I mean, how crazy is that? I tell you, that's unbelievable. I told Billy Gardell that. I said, Billy, I go, you did Mike and Molly, now you're doing this new show, you're a big movie star, you're gonna be like me. You're gonna walk down the street and people are gonna go, hey, look, there's the diabetes guy. You know what I mean? I'm the heartburn guy, he's the diabetes, that's how we've grown up. Known as a generous giver, Larry the Cable Guy's Get Her Done Foundation, a nonprofit that emphasizes children's and veterans' causes, has raised over $7 million for various charities, and many are headquartered near his hometown in rural Nebraska. The Whitney's Get Her Done Foundation donated $250,000 to help establish a program that will offer therapeutic and physical writing therapy for disabled kids and adults. If you have a problem or you're going through a hard time or you have some kind of a disability, there is nothing better than a horse. It soothes the soul, it takes away stress. These days, when he's not performing stand-up or hosting alongside Jeff Foxworthy on their Sirius XM radio channel, you're most likely to find him bringing the shenanigans to the fairways. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's Larry the Cable Guy down here doing stuff. RFD's down here, and I grabbed the microphone, and we are interviewing the fabulous Mr. Tom Lehman who just got off the fabulous here Branson par three course. And I'll be honest with you, uh, he missed some putts. Uh, this is Patrick Gotch, a lot of y'all recognize him. He used to do stripper grams for blind people uh, back in the uh, 80s. This I gotta show you, this is crazy. This is a trophy 
that I got at the Bass Pro Shop, Legends of Golf down at the Bass Pro Shops. And this is the trophy. Johnny Miller and I were teammates, and we were up against the big guns. We were up against Kid Rock and Jack Nicklaus and Lee Trevino and uh, Mark Wahlberg. And uh, what's the little English guy's name? I can never remember. Uh, Gary Player? Gary Player, yes. So, <laughs> little English guy. Sorry, Gary. I could, I, sometimes I forget names and I gotta like, anyway. Things like 400 pounds. Johnny Miller and I won this thing. We're sitting there and Johnny looks, there's two of these. And Johnny goes, hey, is that the trophy? I says, I don't know, I think so. And he goes, that big thing's a trophy? I go, it looks like it, there's two of them up there. He goes, that's gonna cost me $6,000 just to get to the house. I go, Johnny, I don't know, I got my own trouble. I don't know how I'm gonna get it home either if that's the trophy. He goes, well, that's just nuts. Then he sits back and he goes, I'll be honest with you, if I'd have saw that before we played, I'd have missed those putts. <laughs> like, Johnny, come on. I gotta do a lot of stretching. You get older, you gotta do a lot of stretching. You know? I'll actually throw something out doing the stretch. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. But I got into golf because I started getting invited to all these charity events. And I don't golf. So I found myself going, but I sat in the cart with a megaphone and uh, I'm not stretching now, I have gas. Oh. <laughs> I found myself just driving around for six hours, making fun of everybody. And I'm like, well, I should learn how to golf. You'd think at some point I'd stop playing because I'm so, my body's so messed up. I, I, I got, my neck hurts, my back hurts, but I just like golfing. Um, but it's uh, one of those sports you gotta play a lot, but I'm work my handicap down to about a 12. That's great. That's pretty good. Yeah. I, my American Century for the first three years I was teamed up with Charles Barkley and Kevin Nealon, and it was such a blast. Charles is fun to golf with, and I was really excited one time. They asked him on the NBA basketball show who one of his favorite people to play golf with was. He said me, so that was kind of neat. This is my first golf lesson I've ever given. I'm going to give it to Christina, and um, this is uh, my buddy Jared will be bringing us some golf clubs. It's nice to see him up and around. He's a Horrible alcoholic, and we've been trying to cure him. This is the first time I've seen him sober. So Jared's brought you up uh, an iron. What do we have here? It's an eight iron. Okay. Ain't this all? This is a, a person that's not very good teaching somebody that's never played. You relax your arms and get a nice grip. That's where you're gonna be, right here. Then when you're ready to hit, keep your head down, pull back, head down, and then follow through like that. This is all you're doing. And you're not moving your head. You go like that, and then. That was nice. Okay. Boom. Yeah, perfect. Felt Look at good. That. Felt good. All right. You will be on the LPGA tour in a week and a half. You keep that up. What is it that fuels your passion? to keep people laughing and to make them happy. There's no better feeling in the world than getting on a stage and just controlling the, the laughter. You can make them laugh loud, soft. I mean, just kind of, it's like you're, you know, you're directing. It's awesome. Well, I will say, hitting one of these golf shots, I like those too. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty fun. I don't know, it's close between a nice, uh, nice wedge in at 100 and making a bunch of people laugh, it's a close call. I will say, making people laugh makes more money for me than hitting a 100 yard wedge. I'll tell you that much, because I'm not making any money at this stupid thing. But man, it's, uh, yeah, there's no better feeling than that, just control. And you know what's weird about it? People don't know all that goes into it, because they think you're just getting up and telling jokes, but you're not. You know, Seinfeld talked about this. And, and it's true, there's, like he said, he would do a certain hand gesture after a joke. And he noticed it got a bigger laugh with his right hand than his left hand. No idea why, it's just the way it is. It's the same with me. Um, when you walk, you have certain jokes you tell over here, and then you have certain jokes you're telling as you're walking. 
it triggers memory. Like I have a, I do one-liners. So I do, man, there's probably 280 one-liners in my act, right? Just one after another. And so it's like they're trigger mechanisms to remember what I'm supposed to do. And if I, instead of, like if I do a joke and, I'm, and I normally go this way and I go this way, it really, for a second, it's like, wait a minute, what's next? Because that joke is normally told over there. It's just something about being on stage. You just, your mind is kind of, you know, it's kind of like golf. Here's the thing, your mind is so powerful. You know, and it's kind of like golf. Your career has been dedicated to making people laugh and it's very difficult to do. But it's so important in this world when so many people are going through hard times. Have you had any messages or fan mail in the past of people just letting you know how much your comedy has helped them get through some tough times? You know what? I get a lot of, why are you still in the business? You need to quit. This isn't funny. And that's just from my family. I don't know what I'm going to do about them. Uh, actually, yeah, you get all kinds of stuff encouraging things, you know. Somebody, you know appreciate this saw you a long time ago i was going through cancer and i saw you do this and it's awesome you know it's like jeff said everybody's got a boiling point you know and and laughter is just that little valve that pops some steam out and you get to go out and and let it all loose and enjoy so i'm always defending all comics even comics i don't like because number one it's a hard business it's tough to get into and if you're able to develop a following and people follow you and laugh that's a good thing. Now there's a difference between, um, it's like some of the late night shows now. They used to be funny, but now it's like a big political rally. Look, if you're getting, instead of laughter, you're getting this, ah! if that's what you're getting instead of, ah, ah, you're not doing comedy. You're doing a political lecture, you know? So I'm all for politics that's funny that I don't agree with. If it's funny, to, if, if it's a joke, if they're making jokes, if they're just up there complaining, and you know what I mean? Yeah, you're not There's, looking for applause, you're looking for laughter. Yeah, exactly, you're looking for laughter, not, uh, not uh, we agree applause. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a difference there. But I stick up for all comedy. Comedy is a fun thing, and I know some people go, well, he's too this or he's too that. You know what, then don't go, <laughs> it's not that hard. You know, stay away from it, don't go. But fortunately, you know, I got a lot of people that like what I do. And You have universal appeal, which is really hard to do as a comic. Yeah, and I love every one of them, you know. I mean, just the fact that they've kept me still after all these years, they're still paying to come out and see me. It's pretty awesome. What's your message to rural America, just to inspire the kids out there? Well, my message to rural America is to keep speaking out for the truth. Don't be ashamed of, of how you grew up. Don't be ashamed of what you believe. Look, I love Jesus. I, I do all these tournaments and stuff. I'm not ashamed of it. Just don't be ashamed of anything. And if you're a kid growing up in rural America, you can do, look, as long as you wor work hard, don't give up. Be kind to people. Have a, you know, do that and it's limitless to what you can do. 